Um, it's, it's actually a pleasure to be here. I don't really get to speak to people in the academic side of things very often. And um, the idea that there are still so many young and smart people um, dedicating themselves to healthcare and to medicine at a, a very challenging time like this is, is really uh, very heartening to see. You know, on the one hand, this, you couldn't be doing it at a better time. You've got all these great scientific advances coming at you, and you're going to be able to do so much more in terms of predicting and preventing and treating health uh, and illness. And um, at the same time, costs are out of control. There's all this concern. You know, the new administration is going to have to deal with so many problems with people who are uninsured. We just wrote a story a couple of weeks ago that with this latest big economic crisis that we're all facing, even people with insurance um, are deciding to put off health care because they think this is something that, oh, well, I don't have to go to the doctor. I'll just skip that because i got to pay you know, the rent and the tuition and the food bill and the electric bill this, this month, and I might lose my job. So it's, it's certainly a challenging time. And in the midst of all this, um, you still have a lot of problems in medicine, which is patients, you know, we, we sort of we rely on you to take care of us, um, and at the same time, we hear so many things, and certainly I, covering healthcare as I do now, you know, I wonder, wow, you guys are learning how all this works. You're learning about evidence-based care. You're learning about all of the things that are, you know, quality care, effective care, and yet you go out into the medical community and there are so many variations in the way care is delivered. You see the Dartmouth Atlas, which says in this part of the country they do 50% more you know, cardiac interventions than they do in this part of the country, and you wonder, why, is it, why isn't this better? Why do we spend so much on healthcare in America, and why isn't it so much better than it is? And so you, you keep hoping the next generation is going to figure that out for us. Um, now, I came to the coverage of healthcare through my own personal experience. When I was 37 years old, I was working for the Wall Street Journal, and I had a very glamorous job at the time, which was to cover the entertainment industry. And I wrote about Hollywood and the mergers of the big studios and um, all of the big media deals that were being done. And I really didn't know anything about medicine, and I didn't know anything about science. I think I, I, think I took one science course in high school, and somehow I got away with nothing in college. And I kind of started to slow down a little bit in my 37th year, and I felt tired and fatigued and sick and ill, and I thought, well, I guess I better go to the doctor and get a checkup. And the classic story of, you know, we all, we all sort of, those of us who have been cancer patients, always kind of divide everything in our life to one day before you knew you had cancer and the day after you find out that you did, and, and that's sort of what happened to me. I, I went in for a blood test. Doctor said, ah, don't worry about it. We'll do the blood work just to make sure. And sure enough, the diagnosis turned out to be chronic myelogenous leukemia. Now, informed patient. I didn't know really what leukemia was. I think that was the, what the girl in love story had, but they never really told her. Um, they told her dad, and I think they used the word, but maybe they didn't. And I, I didn't know anything about blood or bone marrow. Bone marrow, I was like, also buco, right? I mean, veal <laughs> with pasta. And I, I just knew nothing. I came from such an, and I think well, certainly then, more so than now, I think most people were completely ignorant of their own biology and really the word cancer was so frightening because you really thought, well, that's a death sentence. And fortunately, um, increasingly in the last you know, couple of decades, you know that is no longer a death sentence. But at the time, what I had to do was find out very quickly everything that I could about this disease that was threatening to take my life. And I had to familiarize myself with concepts that I didn't understand. And I had to make decisions that really were one-time decisions. You decide you're going to do it this way, and this is going to affect whether you live or die. Now, one of the little, the little flyer that went around said I used the internet to make these decisions. The fact is, there was no internet then, which I think none of you were, were probably just born when that was, you weren't even born when the internet was not here. But um, there was no internet to speak of. You couldn't go to Google and put in chronic myelogenous leukemia, and you couldn't get access to papers from medical journals. You really couldn't get any information as a regular person at all. As a journalist, you could get a little more access. Um, you could go into some electronic archives, but you couldn't really find at your fingertips the kind of information that you needed to make decisions. Now, I was very fortunate. Um, I had friends. Um, I had a a researcher at Rockefeller University who was a good friend who was able to get into Medline and pull down all kinds of scientific studies about bone marrow transplantation and about the different types of transplantation that were being done. 
Uh, now, your average patient would have walked into you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering where I was going to be treated, and they would have said, we're going to do it this way. And you would have said, okay, that's what we're going to do. Through the help of a, a research, researcher friend, through my mother who was a nurse, and through other colleagues who were medical journalists, we were able to pull together enough data that showed us that there were several different ways of approaching bone marrow transplants. And not everyone agreed with how to do it. And I won't get into the technicalities of it. You have enough homework, and I'm sure you all know what T cells are and not T cells by now in your careers. But um, I, I didn't really know what they were, but I, I had to make a decision, basically, between having a T-cell depleted transplant and a non-T-cell depleted transplant. And again, because I had a chronic form of leukemia, I was able to have a little time to make these decisions. I had insurance. I had an employer who was very understanding. I had a lot of things that a lot of people I recognize in America don't have. And I was able, through the help of these friends and colleagues and family members, to use this information to make the decision that I would go 3,000 miles from my home to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle to have this transplant. And, um, and I will tell you that at that time, as a patient, it was very difficult to find doctors who were used to a patient like me, who would come in, sit down, and said, well, I'm, I read this paper, I have this paper from the uh, journal blood, which shows that your long-term disease-free survival rates here at this hospital for this particular type of transplant are less than 25%. Could you give me some information about that? And you'd get these kind of blank stares because this wasn't information that they were really providing to patients or sharing with patients. And um, it wasn't because they were bad or because they were, you know, trying to hide something. It was because that was what they were working out and the way they were doing their transplants, and they thought they were onto something, so they were doing something differently. And they really want, I know they wanted to save my life. They didn't want me to die. I know that. But they didn't really want to have a conversation with me about how could we do this differently. So I was able to find, fortunately, some physicians who were not only doing things in a way that measurably was better, but were also willing to discuss why this was better for me. And I was able to make this decision. And again, lucky to be able to afford to go to Seattle and live for um, some time and go through this bone marrow transplant. Now, I always like to bring a few visual aids, so I hope I can figure out how I do this. But, oh, that's backwards. Is that shown? No, okay. No, I don't want to go there yet, though. Okay, we're going to go back to the beginning, because that's, okay. So when you first get to Seattle, there are some very important, there's a really important thing you have to do. Um, that's me in my hospital bed. I haven't sat down yet, and I still look pretty good. The first thing you have to do is go to the Pike Pace Fish Market and kiss a fish, and that's for good luck. So has anyone ever been to Seattle here? Okay, you guys know what a cool place this is, right? Okay. So you go to the fish market, and you, um, then you go to your hospital, and you get some chemotherapy. And doesn't seem so bad for a while. And then it seems to get a little worse, and then a little worse, a little worse. You try to keep up with work, which I did. They gave me two phone lines. People send you things to make you feel better. That was a good one. You put your dark glasses on because the light starts to hurt your eyes. You get balloons. Your brother, who's your bone marrow donor, walks you around the hall. You have to wear a mask. Things tickle you and you laugh. Sorry, these are upside down, guys. I had to wear a mask. My immune system was really, you know, destroyed by uh, the chemotherapy so that I could um, get the bone marrow transplant. You know, you have to go through two weeks of very almost lethal doses of chemotherapy. And, and for a while, you know, you, it doesn't matter much. You, I walked around. I was always hooked up to those machines. That's my dad. Kind of like the legs. I don't know if it was really the appropriate look for the hospital. But uh, um, I didn't wear, want to wear my hospital gown. And... Um, uh, my brother made sure that I still got exercise, and they would wheel me around if I had to go places and was tired in the radio flyer wagon because I was in the pediatric ward. Um, we danced in my hospital room, and then I hair started to fall out, and this was, I, this was my favorite. If anyone remembers the Three Stooges, this is my, my I think it was Curly that had that hairdo. But I decided I was going to just shave it all off, shave it all off, shave it all off, and in the end, that's it, down on the floor. And the next few weeks were tough. Um, did a lot of um, headwear. My brother, who's a Marine officer, um, we call it the Mighty Marine Marrow. That's the stuff that he gave me. Uh, came and visited me a lot and stick around to give me platelets. My other brother gave me placelets. I celebrated my birthday in the hospital. 
This is one of my nurses. That pink basin that you've probably noticed is in every shot, never left my side, and I'm sure you know why. Chemotherapy has some pretty ravaging experiences. Um, people sent me a lot of videos and music and things like that to keep me occupied. There was always a party in my room. So you guys, these are doctors and nurses, and they liked my room because there was always something going on. My mom, who was my private duty nurse, who was also a nurse. This is my brother. They're kind of looking at him to sort of see, you know, when you give bone marrow, you give the, um, you have to go into the back. I don't think they have to do it that way anymore. I think they can now mostly get it from the stem cells. But then they had to go into his back like hundreds of times with a needle. So it was actually pretty hard on him. And this was my first really bad wig. <laughs> and this was my better wig. And that's where we got started. And um, uh, so I just wanted to share some of those with you just to kind of give you an idea of what it was like. And it, it, hard as it may be believe, it, it didn't, in my memory, it's, the pictures are more like what it was like, but it was pretty horrible. And um, the process of going through a transplant um, is something that I would not wish on anybody, but at the time it was the only way that you could possibly survive what I, what I had to go through. Now, all that I went through and everything that I learned inspired me to, to write this book, and by the time I came around to writing it, the internet was there. And all of a sudden, all of those things that I couldn't get before were available to patients. You started to have, you know, you could, Google came along, and you could, you could type in chronic myelogenous leukemia, and you could find things. One of the most amazing things that happened is, you know, it was very hard to find other patients to talk to who had been through transplants and who might have some help for me or some insight. But there were a lot of, of these sort of um, email discussion groups and messaging boards that started up. This was well, well before social networking and Facebook or any of the things that you guys do now. But they had these kind of primitive messaging boards where you could go online and you could find other patients. And you could really share some information. And patients became, I think, really activist in those days. I don't know how many of you have heard about the drug Gleevec, which is one of the first targeted therapies that's come out. Now, today, if you're diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia, the first-line therapy is actually a pill. You don't have to go through the bone marrow transplant. You can go on that drug. And if you take it for the rest of your life and you don't become resistant to it, so far it has managed to keep this, this type of disease in check. When you become resistant to it, there are more drugs um, that are already in the market, on the market, and in the pipeline. And this became very interesting to me because in addition to deciding that I was really interested in the subject of healthcare as both a writer and a journalist, um, I continued to be a patient because um, even though technically they tell you after five years you shouldn't have to worry and after 10 years you're completely cured, I had always had, I always thought I might have to come back to this because I had um, what they called M uh, MRD, minimum residual disease. So in my tests every year they would say I was fine but there was a few little platelets floating around in there that they weren't quite sure about. And so I always knew that there was a chance that it would come back. So I continued to educate myself about advances in the medical field, advances in hematology. I actually went both as a journalist and as a patient to the American Society of Hematology meetings every year. And I would, you know, kind of buttonhole doctors and, um, and I would try to read through the papers and keep up with what was going to happen. And I, I really focused on what they were doing with people who relapsed because I knew that this was, I just knew this was something that was probably, I just had a feeling even though everybody said, no, nah, don't worry, but I worried because that's what I do. And um, sure enough, 10 years later, it did come back. And at that time, I had other decisions to make and I had to use all kinds of information that was now at my fingertips to make those decisions. And there weren't that many studies out about what happened to people that relapsed after as long as I did. So I went from being able to make all of my decisions based on studies and you know, populations of thousands of patients to having to make them sort of a little bit, well, let's try a little of this and let's try a little of that. And in that case, you know, reconsult with my doctor. So leukemia comes back. So now you've got Gleevec. I have my brother who's my original donor. The way to typically treat a relapse would be to take the original donor and just get some, uh, like a donor infusion, a DLI as they call it. And we decided, you know what, since we've got Gleevec, let's take a few months of Gleevec. We'll take those cells, we'll knock them down as far as we can, and then we'll bring in the marrow, sort of like the reinforcements, and we'll clean up whatever's left. And we did that, and it was kind of a different thing, and it was a little experimental, but it worked. And it worked for a couple of years and then the numbers started coming up again. So I have continued to get 
different doses of Gleevec. I've had three different doses of my brother's, um, of my brother's cells. Luckily, he's, um, he's always on reserve and um, on reserve duty, as we say. Um, he was in Iraq for a year and uh, basically running a battalion of Marines in Fallujah. And when he came back from there, uh, the, the cells that he gave me were pretty beat up, so they didn't work. So we went back on the Gleevec. Um, and then he kind of got himself back together again, and um, we got more cells. And right now, knock on wood, they're working, and uh, I have a pretty clean bill of health at this moment. Um, but the reason I'm telling you all this is because I decided to really become you know, a focused, focused on healthcare in my career just because as a patient, a perpetual patient, I'm the informed patient, I'm the perpetual patient, I really see from the inside both the really good things and the things that need help in healthcare. I think a lot of people do investigative journalism. Here's how they hurt this person in healthcare. Here's the terrible thing the doctor did. Here's how the hospitals are you know, screwing this one. I see that there are things that are wrong in healthcare, and I see that there are issues that have to be fixed. But I also see what, you know, I'm alive today because of, you know, people like you who went out there and, and really worked at, at finding ways to make me healthy. And so I'm always trying to approach the coverage of care and the coverage of being a patient from the standpoint of, yes, there are things out there in healthcare that are unknown, not done right, done in error, could be done better, but there's a lot of really dedicated people out there that are trying to fix it, and here's what you need to know to kind of help them do that. So I've tried to write stories that people could use if they're going to a doctor, if they're going into the hospital. Here are some of the pitfalls that you might face. Here are some of the questions to ask your surgeon. You know, today I have a column about blood transfusion. You know, I get a lot of blood transfusions, and one of the things I've had to do is get donor platelets from time to time. So I'm always aware that there's um, some dangers and some issues. I mean, I've seen in the best cancer hospital, you know, in Boston, where I, I go for treatment now uh, just because it's closer than Seattle, um, I have seen my brother and me get blood taken, and I've seen my label slapped on his tube. I have seen donor marrow come back to me with um, a label on it that indicated that the dose was 10 times the dose I was supposed to receive. I mean, I've seen these things, and I have intercepted them. And that's a little scary. But it isn't because anybody's bad or trying to kill me. It's because it's standing room only in this hospital. There are cancer patients going out the door. There are demands on their time. There are short resources. There are lots of things going on. These people aren't paid that great. They're not you know, necessarily trained as well as they should be. There isn't as much oversight because everybody's really busy. And I think the question is, as a patient, how much responsibility do we have to make sure that our care is you know, safe and our care is the best we can get? Well, we have a responsibility, and I think it has to be a partnership. And I have said pretty much from the beginning, you know, I say to my doctors in the end, I can't make this decision. I have to rely on your judgment. But let's talk about all of these issues and let's talk about how we can make things safer. You know, I'm not out to expose your hospital, but you know, you have given the wrong chemotherapy to another journalist and killed her. So, you know, um, these things do happen. Um, I try to focus on the processes of care. You know, the blood transfusion story that I did today said, you know, even though doctors, there are certain guidelines that say you shouldn't transfuse blood to patients above a certain level of hemoglobin be, unless there are other factors. You should always check that. Between here and there, you should talk about it. And under this level, you almost always need to transfuse them. And these guidelines are out there, but the studies show that they're just routinely, they either don't know about them, they ignore them, they like to have their own prescribing habits. For some reason, people worry, doctors are a little suspicious that it's cookbook medicine, I have to do this a little bit, and you have to always rely on judgment as well as guidelines. And, you know, you always hope that there's a mix of those two things and that you're able to converse with your patient and converse as a patient with your doctor. Okay, here are some questions to ask. So I, I lay out all the problems, the solutions that they're doing to try to make things better, and I try to say, okay, patient, if you're going in for a blood transfusion, just ask these five questions. Just ask. You know, it's, you know there are things, I, I'm obsessed, 
from having had no immune system, totally obsessed. I, I keep Purell in business, I really do. And I'm obsessed with germs and, you know, superbugs and, you know, I, I'm so crazy that the little kids in my family just run when they see me coming because, you know, I'm like, the last time they were playing with the field mice in the, in the backyard and I was like, you're going to get the hantavirus, all go in and wash your hands. Now, you spend too much time on the CDC website and believe me, it's, it's totally paranoid and crazy. Um, but I do do that and I actually wrote a story, um, I interviewed the guy who's the head of infectious disease control at the CDC and I said, how do you go through life knowing what you know? And he said, you know, I basically move around trying not to touch anything. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, it, it is, I mean, you should see me in airplane bathrooms, it's like elbows and, and, uh, and, and you know, I, I am paranoid because I once had no immune system and I know what can happen. But so I, I've written a series of stories on the whole superbug issue, you know, and introducing the idea of, of why it's important as a patient. Your role in this is don't take antibiotics if they're not necessary. You know, don't push your doctor because a lot of them will to shut you up and get you out of the office, write you a prescription. You know, why you should ask if you're being prescribed Cipro for a uni urinary tract infection, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Th these are things patients probably need to know. You're not taking over your doctor. You know, the famous thing that doctors now say is the worst thing they can possibly see is a patient who comes and sits down and says, Doc, I was surfing the internet last night. Because, you know, now you know you're going to, there's still a lot of misinformation. There's still a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. The problem with some of these patients who are running these sites is that they begin to think that they know more than the doctor or that their experience somehow should override anything you've had in your experience. So you get some crazy bullies out there who tend to dominate these groups. But if you can find a way to filter some of this stuff and really give um, uh, doctors the opportunity to answer the questions that are legitimate for you to raise, I think as a patient you, uh, you do both of yourself and the doctor a favor. And I think, you know, I don't know how much of your curriculum here, one of the stories that I've been very interested in is how more in academic medicine more of the curriculum is focusing on the doctor-patient relationship, that you are learning more about communication skills that, you know, I've, I've sat in, in a couple of these role-playing exercises where you actually have actors come in and work with the patients. How do you talk to the parents of a dying child? How do you tell someone that they're not going to live? And, you know, role, I mean, it, I think it's probably a good idea to pretend to do that so that you can have some experience, you know, it's like, I guess in the, in the Marines, they pretend to be captured and tortured. And you know, like, this is the sort of the same thing. You have to sort of have some idea. It's not really the same as telling people that you're going to die, but you'll at least have practiced. You know? And I think it's really important to get that into the curriculum. Some of the doctors who are embracing this and really kind of pushing this have said to me that there's that uh, hidden curriculum in medicine where you might learn all of those things as medical students, like you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to talk to the patient, you're supposed to respect the patient. But then they get into, you know, surgery and they see the doctor talking over the patient and, you know, making jokes and stuff that you see on Grey's Anatomy or whatever. And, you know, it isn't really you, what you're taught and what you're seeing might be different. And so how do you incorporate everything you're learning as, as students into how you deal with patients, you know, because one of the most amazing, you know, I have so many doctors who I've dealt with who are so incredibly simpatico and empathetic. But cancer doctors especially are dealing with people who are dying all the time. And as doctors, you have, you have to both, you have to somewhere draw the line between empathy and being able to look people in the eye and talk to them and, you know, really have a heart when you speak to them and being able to kind of, you know, keep yourself to yourself so you can function and not be overcome by the emotion of that person or of the situation and um, you know don't throw up over the surgical patient you know you might throw up over the patient who you have to tell they're gonna die I, I don't know so those are all things that I think as um, as a um, doctor in training that that all of you um, have ahead of you to learn and um, I hope that in your training you'll get to do uh, more of that. And, you know, as I said, the downsides of the informed patient are that their information is often not right. And they often have no, um, have no basis for believing what they believe. There are huge cultural differences now that you have to cope with. You know, this country is such a wonderful melting pot of people, but those people have very different views. And Cultural sensitivity is probably something you're going to be learning about. You know, we just did a really interesting front page story about Montefiore 
and about how they often have to deal with patients who come from cultures where you can't even say the word cancer, that someone has cancer is not to be spoken. And the patient shouldn't be told what you think of as something from the dark ages maybe, but in this culture we don't talk about cancer. We don't, you know, maybe I don't believe my religion doesn't allow me to get, you know, those drugs. Um, you know, there are still people who don't uh, allow their children to be cared for. You have religious groups that don't believe in medicine. So, you know, you have to juggle all of this even as you're learning all these great advances and uh, even as patients are coming to you and saying, okay, doctor, I read your paper and it doesn't really agree with the paper that I read from your competitor over in, you know, Hong Kong or something where they're doing more research onto this. And, and you know, you have to be prepared to assume that that person is intelligent enough. Now, I, I always say it's kind of like learning a little bit of a foreign language. You start talking in, you know, Spanish to someone, and they assume if you've spoken a few words and gotten your question across that you must understand, and they start speaking very quickly, and of course you don't understand anything they say. One of the things I always tell um, patients to do, um, and I did this, and I hope, I think doctors, it makes them a little nervous. I say this is only for me because I'm going to have to go back and listen to this. You know, they have I tape record. I bring tape, I used to bring tape recorders to my meetings with doctors, and um, it was really good, actually, because it ended up helping me write my book because, of course, what they say is you forget 90% of what a doctor tells you the minute you walk out of the office. You just completely forget everything they said to you because as a patient, you're, you're hearing what the doctor says, you're not processing it. While he's telling you something, you're still saying, oh, my God, I have cancer, and you're not getting what he's saying or she's saying, and that is, you know, so important to make sure that patients leave your office understanding what you've just told them and that there's some kind of a follow-up, you know. I mean, one of the things in medicine that, you know, I've, I've never understood is, and I think if we had more electronic patient records and some of the things that hopefully you'll have in your practices going forward, that you'll be able to have a, pa a panel where you're not going to have to go into giant paper folders and try to find your scribbled handwriting, what you wrote or what some other doctor wrote, and you're going to be able to go in there and you know, I've seen some of these systems, the way they work in some hospitals, and they're pretty impressive. I mean, on the one hand, it's a learning curve, and I know at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, they actually did a study which showed that there were more errors once they put in a computerized physician order enter entry system because people didn't know how to use it and they kind of clicked over things. But I think hopefully at some point you'll have all these tools at your disposal. You know, clinical decision support I think is just such an amazing thing for doctors. Again, it's not cookbook medicine, but how can you possibly remember everything you have learned in these years here? And how can you keep up with the fact that after you've learned it, three years later, when you're practicing it, it may be out of date. So what shame is there in, you know, there's actually some great websites for doctors, like uptodate.com, which is actually for doctors. And, you know, go back and get the references. The fact that you can go online, you don't have to go through, you know, find where the textbook is. You can go online and you can remind yourself. You can see what the latest data is on, on Gleevec. Should you be prescribing your patient Gleevec? What about these two new other drugs, you know? These are maybe they're not tolerating Gleevec. You can immediately find information, and you don't just have to re you know rely on the pharmaceutical reps to tell you about it. You can really go online very quickly and have at your fingertip information that your predecessors you know didn't have, and maybe maybe weren't able to admit that they needed. Um, and and it's the admission that you always are going to be learning, and it's going to be changing very rapidly as you get into stem cell research and as the genome unfolds, and you're able to understand all of the things that you're going to be learning from all our different genes and how they relate to one another. So um, I was going to show you one more picture just because I, I um, as I said, in my family we always say that um, if you didn't take a picture of it, it didn't really happen. And um, um, am I the CBE guest documents? No. Um, I was just going to show you some, some more pictures of... Um, uh, you may not get my pictures I, in somebody else's system now, and I don't think I can find them. Uh, forward, forward, forward. But my brother, as I said, has, um, I tell him I'm going to put all his kids through college. And, um, he still tells me from the way he misbehaved as a child, and I looked after him, that he still owes me a kidney and a liver. So, um, uh, And he's right. He's right. So... Um, Anyway, I'm sorry you're going to miss the picture of him because I can't figure out how to do this, but um, he's, he's been a, a constant source of support to me and my other brother, um, who I was lucky to have two identical matching, uh, you know, 
you have to have a match in your family. You have like a one in four chance of each sibling being a donor. Oh, somebody's doing this for me. It's like the ghost in the machine is doing this for me. This is um, great. But I just, um, I just wanted to show you, um, I don't know how many of you have seen this technology, but this is the most cool thing in the world. And um, it's, um, it's the aphoresis machine. That's Chris, uh, recently back from Iraq. And, huh? Oh, it didn't work? Is he up there? No? Oh, I can see him. He looks great. <laughs> no. Should I try one more? No. Oh, somebody's trying to do it for me. Who's that ghost in the machine? Watching. He was watching Lost in Space. No? Uh, this is why I never do PowerPoint or anything like that, you know? No? All right. Well, I'll be happy to show any of them to you some other time. But anyway, um, it's been a real family affair for us. And, um, um, you know, one of the things I always say to people, and I'll, I'm going to wrap this up and then see if you guys have any questions. If, if you had told me, you know, years ago that um, I would have said that it was a really interesting and good experience having cancer, I wouldn't have believed it. It's not a club that you ever want to join. Um, but all the really kind of interesting and good things in my life happened to me um, after I had cancer. You know, I, I actually really got excited about my career again. Um, I met the husband I'm married to now, got rid of the one I was married to before. Um, it, a lot of really, really uh, good things happen once you join this club. And as I said, it isn't one that you would ever want to uh, be a member of, but one of the things that you do once you join it, in, and I, I think sharing your experiences, I have this great platform, the Wall Street Journal, from which to do this. Um, but I really... Um, also encourage everybody else to kind of join the community because you now have all this great information and knowledge and you really can help people navigate this very scary world. You know, when I, when I first got diagnosed with cancer, one of my colleagues said to me, well, you're about to enter the nether world of medicine. And um, I, I really was scared and I felt that way, but I don't feel that way anymore. And I think that it's been illuminated in so many ways for us. And I hope that patients illuminate it for you in ways that are important to you as well. So. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Laura, thank you so much. Can I answer any questions for you about the Wall Street Journal, about um, our coverage, about um, any ideas you have about the media and how we cover health care or medicine? Yes? I just have a question. You mentioned before you spoke to a lot of lay groups. And what kind of questions are they asking? Well, a lot of them, actually, I actually speak to a lot of professional groups as well. I mean, to physicians and to um, um, executives, you know, c companies. We, we do a lot of conferences with corporate executives who are trying to figure out their health care expenditures and things like that. But a, a lot of, I speak to patient groups, cancer survivor groups like the wellness group, and people really want to know, how do I, you know, there are so many cancer survivors in this country now. There are just millions of them. And people are treating it more like a chronic disease, and they want to know, how do I live with cancer? Now, I, I'm not going to pretend that people, I am so lucky. I mean, CML, it's a cakewalk compared to what most people go through. You know, breast cancer is more survivable, but I have lost so many friends to these virulent cancers that they still can't do anything about, pancreatic cancer, you know, met metastatic colon cancer, ovarian cancer. So there's still so much to be done. And I know that, I, I know how lucky I am, and I think a lot of people come to me, patients will come to me, and they don't lose hope. And of course, a lot, a lot of people do believe that, you know, it's, even though studies actually show that your positive attitude has absolutely no outcome on your feelings, I don't know if that's actually true. I think it helps you get through, you know, this idea. People said to me, the first thing I always say is, you find out you have cancer, don't project the worst. So people want to know, how do I live with this? How do I go to the doctor? Older people will say to me, but how can you challenge the doctor, you know? I mean, I, you know, I've been with, you know, friends' parents who the friend will start questioning the doctor in the hospital and the dad will say, don't, 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 don't make him mad, you know? And, and that's, that's, I think, a generational shift. What a lot of people want to know is, how do, I get, how do I get five minutes with the doctor? How do I find good information? How do I live with this? How do I, you know, how do I not have my career suffer? How do I not have my you know, family suffer? How do I think every day that I'm going to get up and, you know, not be afraid? And, and so a lot of it's coping, coping. People are really interested in wellness. They want, they're interested in integrative medicine. They want to know, 
okay, I've done everything, I've taken the chemo, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Can you guys do anything in medicine to make me feel better or, you know, kind of just have a kind of a mind, body, spiritual aspect to this, you know? How can we incorporate medicine more into wellness? And I think that's a lot of, uh, you know, I think, I, I always tell people, you don't want alternative, what you want is something that's complementary. Just make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do, follow your regimens. How can medicine, the people want more, you know, they want medicine to help them um, feel better and, and feel more positive about the future. So that's a lot of the questions that I get. How do you deal, how do you deal with it? How do you keep yourself healthy? How do you, you know, not be afraid of dying, you know? Um, and again, I'm lucky. I've been surfing this wave of new technology, and I figure, you know, you stay alive long enough in this disease, and they keep coming up with things that are um, keeping you alive longer. So I'm, I'll be an eternal guinea pig for new, new things, and hope that my brother keeps pumping out the cells. Yes? Well, when you mean the art of medicine, when I was, uh, she was asking about how, how I, actually was too, I thought when you were asking about the art of medicine, I thought you meant medicine is an art because you have all this information and then you have to use your instincts and you have to be like house, I guess, you know. <laughs> Does anybody watch that show? <laughs> you know, not like house, but, you know, the idea that, you know, that you have to be, for, it's so amazing, all these shows about medicine now and this forensic stuff, you can all be consultants on those. Um, but I chose, I, I had two things. The bedside manner is really important, believe it or not. I think a lot of people are going to choose doctors and choose care based on how their gut feels about the people. Now, I chose between, I, I actually had the, I went to four different cancer centers. I had a year because I had chronic leukemia. They tell you if you do a bone marrow transplant within a year, your chances of survival are good. So I went and talked to everybody, and there were so many things going on at the time. Some people were taking out the T cells. Other people were taking out part of the T cells. Some people were taking out the T cells and putting in something else. And then there was Seattle, and they were just doing it with T cells in and, you know, watching for graft-versus-host disease and things like that. And I looked at the statistics. So I balanced two things. I balanced the statistics, long-term disease-free survival, and then it was just I went out there, I sat down with this doctor, he was so excited that I had read all this stuff and that I knew what I was enough that he could really talk to me. And I just, I kind of fell in love with him and them. And I think also I was like this New Yorker and I was like, Seattle, what is this going to be about? And they had just invented Starbucks, if you can believe it. And we were like, what is this Starbucks that's everywhere? It's just, should we buy stock in this company? And of course we didn't. Um, but um, but it, was, it was this so different than New York where, you know, you'd kind of walk into the hospital and I have to tell you, the, one of the things that still really bugs me about hospitals is the front line. You know, you come in and the people who are in the front desk barely look up and they're like, next. And you really want to feel when you're coming in there that they, they greet you and that they say, hi, how are you feeling today? You're all, you know, it's a little bit of a wait, but can we get you anything? And they don't really do that. And that kind of, kind of gets me a little bit. I kind of get a little, it kind of, kind of puts you on the defensive a little bit. And then, you know, it was talking to a doctor who didn't really want to be questioned. And didn't really have time for it. So I made my decision based on numbers, but also based on um, bedside manner and on willingness to engage. And, um, you know, I also think experience. These were people who had been doing this for a long time. And as I said, you have to keep advancing, and that's why we have clinical trials, you know? I mean, the clinical trial process is really interesting. I think a lot of patients still don't really understand it. They're really afraid that they're going to get randomized into something that means they won't get good treatment. They don't understand they're going to get randomized probably into the standard of care. So I think it's really important that, you know, years ago they didn't really, the informed consent process was so, you know, here, sign this, you know, and I think the more that they talk to you about what you're going to go through and why they're suggesting that you do it this way, that to me is how I make my decisions. You know, how much are they engaging me in this? How much are they willing to talk to me? If they've made a mistake, are they willing to acknowledge it? Um, those are all the things, you know. Did someone have a question over here? Yeah, this is just something about journalism that I've always been curious about. Um, healthcare stories, in particular, mm -hmm. many, lots of other stories do this too, but a healthcare story will tend to open up like, you know, Sue Anderson, 45, found out that she was 
The anecdotal lead, that's yeah. what it's called. And you know what, I, I, I hate them, but sometimes they're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's a very interesting question, and I'll tell you there are several ways. Um, I tell it's old fashioned shoe leather. I find them because I have a lot of patient advocacy groups that I deal with. I know a lot of cancer patients who have written to me or who I knew through wellness communities. I will, like a hospital, I will actually, often hospitals are the best sources. Now, you know you have all this HIPAA now and the privacy and, you know, but what I do is if I'm going to do, like, for example, in this story about blood transfusion that I did today, I said, look, the story is about how you shouldn't get blood transfusion. I talked to a surgeon and I said, do you have any patients that you didn't give a blood transfusion to and that you did these things you're telling me about? Like someone who you test him for anemia before you did the surgery and you treated him with Procrit so his counts would come up and then you use cell salvage and a recycler doing the surgery so he could get his own blood back. So you, do you have anybody who actually did that before who'd be willing to talk to me about it? And almost always the doctors will go out and they'll get a patient and they'll, you know, the organization will consent the patient but they'll say, do you want to talk to this person? And most of the time people are thrilled to talk to you. Um, so I, I, I always go into a, a, a story up front the first thing I say in hospitals who are trying to tell me what a great job they're doing of, you know, we are eliminating bed sores by turning these patients on a regular basis. I mean, don't, can you get me a patient who you've been turning and what they think of it? I, I, that's what you do. <laughs> and it's usually the second question I ask them. I'm going to need real people because you just tell me what you're doing. And, and, you know, the people, you know, a lot of times the hospitals, you know, they know they're, well, they might not say something entirely nice about us, but... Um, we actually get amazing letters. You know, I wrote a piece on C. diff. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's the only time I've had the word diarrhea three times on the front section of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and they kept saying, can we just say the diarrhea once and then get it onto the jump? And, um, you know, C. diff, as you know, is this terrible complication of, of often appropriate antibiotic therapy, but it's a very virulent bug now, and it's incredibly um, contagious and spreads you know, I mean, you think, you, you know, alcohol gel, which kills MRSA and other bugs, just kind of dries this up and then spores come off and it goes on the doorknob and you, it, it's scary. And um, I actually found a patient um, through one of the hospitals who was treated for this because one of the nurses that I talked to, it wasn't at their hospital, but they had a, a sister-in-law who had gone through it and, you know, told me these horror stories about what had happened to her. And then what happens is we get an amazing amount of letters from patients. Um, my email address is at the bottom of the columns. And I just get to tons and tons of correspondence. Uh, we have a health mailbox people will write in. We are, you know, the journal, because none of you kids are reading newspapers anymore in print, we are very big online uh, now. And online we have... Um, all kinds of communities and forums and uh, more opportunity than ever for people to reach out to us. Um, but it, it's, it's um, you know, the one thing that we, we, you do see a lot of is sometimes you have to be careful because people might be using you to, if it's been a problem, you know, they might, you know, they have a lawsuit or they want to try to get some kind of settlement. So you have to weigh everything with a grain of salt and make sure you check their story. But, you know, usually you can find people who are willing to, be anecdotes, you know, in, in your story. Um, and uh, even if they've had C. diff and then have to talk about it in front of two million people. So not a pleasant thing at all. Any other questions? I'm kind of curious if I can ask you guys some questions. Um, how many of you are already done with the school part? You're all in the school part. Okay. It's like first year? Second? Okay, and do you know already what you want to do, or do you kind of pick that later? And does anyone have ideas of what kind of areas they want to go into? I'm just sort of curious. Are you is it research or is it more practice? Um, what do you want to do? <laughs> you in the pink. <laughs> Too, too soon, so people don't go in knowing, you know. And then I know, look, one of the things that we're really, huh? Yeah. Does anybody already know? Or they don't want to, like, tip their hand? Yes? Psychiatry. Psychiatry. Well, you know, one of the things that I, we, we've been writing a lot about is this growing, you know, sh you, know you guys are going into a tough, a lot of people decide, well, I'm going to go into a specialty where I don't have to worry about these cuts in Medicare reimbursement and, you know, all these new, measures that I'm going to have to deal with and, and 
you know, one of the things we, we worry about the most is the shortage of, you know, um, primary care physicians and the shortage of people who are trained to deal with an aging population, you know, geriatricians and, um, you know, special, some of the specialties. And um, I know that there are, you know, more remunerative specialties that you can go into, like orthopedic surgery and, you know, plastic surgery and things like that, all of which are great things to do. But um, I always wonder, you know, if there were more incentives to go into primary care medicine, you know, would, would people be doing it more? Because one of the things, I'm curious about this, because one of the things, we're doing a big summit after the election um, to try to talk about what the new administration's priorities should be in four areas, including health care. And so we're going to be convening a group of, you know, big mockers to um, uh, talk about these things. And um, I wonder, I think, I think what they're going to be focused on is cutting costs of health care, because most mostly going to be big CEOs, and getting coverage that they don't necessarily have to provide because one of the big fears is the smaller employers can't afford to provide coverage. So will they be penalized? And how will people get health care coverage in an in a in a, in a, in a economy where even if you were getting you know, health care coverage from your employer, all of a sudden you're not employed or your employer went under. Your employer has no funding. He can't get credit from the banks. So I think there's going to be a lot of issues that we have to you know, face about who's going to pay for health care and who's going to cover the uninsured and, you know, is anybody interested in emergency or trauma care here? Okay, okay. <laughs> that's great because, you know, there, there's so much, you know, uh, that needs to be done and the system is so uh, stressed right now and, you know, the, the uh, safety net uh, that emergency care is having to provide, you know, some of the stories that I've done, you know, which have been so harrowing to hear about are, you know, the boarding of, of people in, uh, you know, emergency rooms and the fact that so many people are using emergency rooms as their, you know, only primary care, care for the indigent and the, you know, people who aren't here legally but need to get medical care, people who sit for, you know, these horror stories that you hear about people dying in the emergency room because no one got to them. So I think, you know, there are some really interesting dynamics as you, as you head into, into your next few years and hopefully by the time you get out a lot of this will have sorted itself out and it'll be it'll be easier I, I really hope so because there's so much promise um, as well so anyway thanks for your time